I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Greetings and salutations. Welcome to another fabulous day in the Lord's neighborhood and to another episode of Coffee, the Bible, and Page. I'm Page, your caffeine-imbued host. Here's my coffee. In the beginning, coffee, and lo, it was very good. Today, we are going to continue our journey into March. We're reaching the end of Mark's gospel, uh, or close to it. We have 16 chapters in Mark. We're in chapter 13. And today, we're going to be looking at Mark's or should I say Peter's uh, remembrances of the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus has his last, from what I've been able to gather, his last major teaching time with his disciples. And there's some, there's some incredible things that he says here. Now, I want to preface this with, uh, I think that we really, really, really need to pay attention to the Mount Olivet Discourse. And here's why. When I get to the point, should I have the honor and privilege of knowing ahead of time that God is calling me home? Let's say I'm in hospice, and I know that within the next day or two, God is going to be calling me home. The words that I speak to my family in that last day or two on this earth are going to be very important words. I'm going to try to speak words to my family, things that I want them to know that are the most important things that I want them to remember from me. When John writes his gospel, he wrote that at the end of his life. The, it, in essence, it was like his last word, his last testament. And so that's what makes John's gospel so different from the other gospels. Uh, the other gospels are pretty much a narrative of the life of Jesus, and John has that, but his is a collection of events and sayings that he desperately wants his followers to know that these are what the most important things John has to say about Jesus. And when he writes his epistles, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Revelation, these are the words of a man who's at the end of his life, and therefore every word that John writes is packed with importance. These, this is the last major teaching time with Jesus and his disciples. And Therefore, every word that's here is important. And time is compressed. And this is what I mean by that. Jesus is going to be talking about the signs of the end of the age. And sometimes it's hard to tell, is he talking about what's getting ready to happen to Jerusalem and the temple? Or at the end of the age, age when he comes back in the clouds and, and the enemy is totally destroyed and things are set right. So whatever your conclusions are based on what I'm saying here today, I encourage you, you need to read this and think about this yourself. So without any further ado, let's get started. Now, I'm using a study Bible, an NIV study Bible. So all my notes here are coming from that. They're just reminders of me, and they're, this is so important. Jesus' prophecy of the destruction of the temple which gives rise to the disciples' questions, warnings against deceivers, as well as signs of either the temple's destruction or the end of the age, one, either, or both, the coming of the Son of Man, the lesson of the fig tree, and exhortation to watchfulness. All this is the greatest challenge is determining when Jesus is speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem and when he's speaking about the second coming. Sometimes it's not clear. But regardless of whether it's not clear, does not negate its importance. We need to think on these things, which leads me to my next point. What you're getting here in my devotionals is me thinking with my mouth open. 
I'm not even going to pretend to be a prophet or a great teacher of the word. I am just a blue collar guy who's reading the Bible and drawing from it what I can that will enable me to do one of two things or both things. One, to learn something about God. Two, to learn something about me. So join me in my thinking with my mouth open adventure, but realize that really you need to think for yourself too. So let's get started. Chapter 13, verse 1. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones. What magnificent buildings. According to Josephus, some of these buildings, stones were 37 feet long, 12 feet high, 8 feet wide. Monstrous, monstrous. The temple must have been an incredible structure. Do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Now, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they're about to be fulfilled? This, what Jesus is about to say is not necessarily the signs of the end of this age that we're in, but more like these signs are characteristics of the new age which the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus ushered in. We are in the last days. Um, That sounds kind of confusing. Let me see if I can clear that up a little bit. What we're about to read is that we are getting, that Jesus is telling them that God is getting ready to usher in this new age, the last days, if you will, and these are the signs that are preceding it. And the last days, the new age, is ushered in by the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We are in the last days now. Some of the things that Jesus is going to talk about here have already been fulfilled. Some of them have not. So we have the wonderful beauty of 2020 hindsight as we read through these things. We can ask ourselves, has this been fulfilled? Yes or no? And that will say, oh, well, then, then this was for the disciples in Israel. And those things that have not but yet been fulfilled, well, that's for the age that we're in, this end days, which, again, was ushered in by the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I'm he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. All right, well, I kind of think that's that falls in category of both. Um, there are always rumors of what Rome was going to do to Jerusalem and to Israel, and but that continues through today. Um, nations rising against nations, uh, kingdom against kingdom, um, earthquakes, various places, famines. It's the beginning, and we see that happening today. That's continued through today. You must be on your guard. Now, here he's talking very specifically to the disciples about the, their immediate future. You will be handed over to the local councils, flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will you stand before the governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Before the end of the end, the gospel must be preached to all nations. Now, does that mean that the gospel has to be preached to every single living person on this planet? That's a good question. He says here it's got to be preached to all nations. And that's when he's saying the end comes. So This statement can't be referring to their immediate future because, yes, the the disciples went out uh, into their immediate world, but they didn't go to all nations. That's coming much later in time. We're in that time now. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, don't worry beforehand what to say. Say whatever's given you at the time, for it's not you speaking but the Holy Spirit. Now, brother will betray brother to death 
and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Now, again, this falls in the category of, is it referring to their immediate future or to the future future where you and I are living now? I say both. But we're seeing this more and more. Basically, Jesus is saying violence is going to increase and increase to the point where you're not even going to be safe in your own family. Father will put his child to death. Brother will betray brother. Children rebel against parents, have them put to death. It's just the progression of evil will get to the point where there is no safe place. Used to be the family was the safe place. He says, it's going to become a time when that's not going to be the case. I look at what's going on in the world around us today, and I see us running headlong to destruction. I'm seeing the absolute destruction of the family. I'm seeing and reading news events of the most horrific kind. The violence that is just being promulgated here in our country is just stunning to me. We're seeing that. And he says, but the one who perseveres or stands firm to the end will be saved. Now, you can interpret that one of two ways. In order to be saved, you have to make it through to the end. Or you could be saying, the one who makes it to the end, is that one is proven to be saved. Only the saved people will make it to the end. We call The Presbyterians call that the perseverance of the saints. You don't get saved and then hang on in order to remain saved. If you're truly saved, you will make it to the end because of the staying power of the Holy Spirit, the grace of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. Another discussion for another time. But in John's gospel, Jesus lays out how salvation works. And if you are saved, you are always saved. You will persevere to the end. Persecution and tribulation has always been the great divider, if you will. It has always been uh, the thing that sorts out true believers from wannabe believers. A lot of people are in love with the idea of being a Christian. But not everybody pays the price that it takes to be a Christian. When you truly give your life to Christ, what you're doing is you're setting yourself up to be an enemy of the world. And not everybody likes that thought. When you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. What's this abomination of desolation thing? Well, this he's referring to a prophecy that Daniel made concerning the desecration of the Jerusalem temple by Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 BC. Jesus uses this horrific event in Israel's past to predict a similar one in the future. Now, whether or not this is an event that occurred in the first century or still future, tense is uncertain. So this could be an... But if it if it's possible that it's referring to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem by Rome at AD 70, possibly. But... That phrase, the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong. Antiochus was an emperor that stood where he did not belong. He stood in the temple and he erected an altar to Zeus on top of the altar in the holy place of the temple. That's what this uh, the NIV Study Bible says. Um. According to some, there's still two more stages in this progressive fulfillment of the predictions in Daniel. The Roman destruction of the temple in AD 70 and a future setting up of an image of the Antichrist in Jerusalem. And we see hints of that in Revelation and First and Second Thessalonians. There is the abomination of desolation standing where it does not belong. It's referring to a person. And the abomination that causes desolation. The abomina- This is something so horrific who is attacking the things of God with such violence. He's an abomination and he causes desolation, destruction, total, complete destruction. 
when you see the abomination standing where it does not belong, I really believe Jesus is referring to the temple and to Jerusalem. And that was, he's, he's speaking in the future because he says, when you see, in other words, it's still coming, when you see the abomination that causes desolation. And he's using that term that Daniel used, referring them back about almost 200 years previous when a like event took place with Antiochus Epiphanes. So this is a prophetic word of Jesus saying that what you saw 300 years or 200 years ago, it's going to happen again. And when you see that, when you see something like that happening, hmm, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it would be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray this will not take place in winter because those days will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or look, there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I've told you everything ahead of time. This happened in AD 70 when Rome laid siege to Jerusalem and eventually destroyed the temple. It was a, a terrible time. And it was a time when the destruction of Israel was so complete and so unrivaled that it would be almost 2,000 years before Israel would come back. They were scattered to the four winds. The destruction of Israel would be so complete and unequaled that the nation of Israel would vanish from the world for almost 2,000 years, not to be reestablished until just after World War II. And if you stop and think about the gravitas of that statement that Jesus just spoke, then you would have to say that the reemergence of Israel indeed is ushering in the end of the end of days, the end days, which began when Jesus died and rose. We are in the end days. And Israel has come back as a nation. Now, whether or not you believe that Israel is still God's chosen people, I do believe that, that they still have a place in God's history and in God's plan, you have to acknowledge the fact that the fact that they are a nation after such complete annihilation is a miracle. And if you stop and think about all the uh, nations and peoples in that part of the world, the Philistines, where are the Philistines now? The Hittites, where are the Hittites now? Uh, the Amorites, where, where are all the ites? Only one of the ites is still here, and that's Israelites. Israel had maintained a national identity even without a nation that they could call their own. The Jewish people have been the, sort, the, have been the, the focus of such an incredible, intense persecution that almost no other people on this planet have ever, ever endured, and yet they are still here. They maintained their national identity, and they came back as a nation. They are now an established nation on the world scene. That is a miracle. That's why I still say they're God's chosen people, in the sense that God still has a place for them. He's chosen them for a task and a place. And not only were they to be caretakers of God's words and God's and caretakers of the worship of Jehovah, which gave birth to Christianity, he's also using them as a sign and uh, a proof that we're coming to the end of the end. I really truly believe that. In those days, following that distress, Jesus says, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. This is imagery. It depicts the undoing of creation. Commonly used by Old Testament prophets to describe God's awful judgment on a fallen world. 
Now, whether these things will actually physically happen like this, or if this is just a picture and a and a a, uh, a picturesque way of describing God's judgment, we'll have to wait and see. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. All right, obviously this is the future because this has not happened yet. Um, I've met people who who really try to take the pure historical approach to these prophecies and try to come up with a way of explaining how the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory has already taken place and how that's symbolic. Of, ah, it, this isn't symbolic. Son of Man is a title that refers to Messiah, that refers to Jesus, and Jesus is calling himself that. And he says at that time, at the end, when God's judgment is being unleashed on a fallen world, the Son of Man will come in the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now, who are his elect? Those whom he has chosen. And does that mean Israel? No, not just. God's elect have always been those who worship him. And there's always been Gentile and Jew worshipers of God. Throughout Jesus' lineage, there's Gentiles. Israel's place as a chosen people was not to be the only people that would be saved. That's not what meant to be chosen. They were chosen by God for a task, to be a light on the hill, to preserve his words, and to present to the world a message that we have a God to worship. His name is Jehovah. They're chosen for that. But we Gentiles, we're part of that chosen people now. In fact, we've always been part of that chosen people. God always has a seat at his table for Gentile and Jew. So the Son of Man is going to come at the end of the age. And he will gather his elect from the four winds, the ends of the earth, to the ends of the heavens. Now, some people think that's going to happen before his final judgment is unleashed. Some people believe that if you take this literally, when his, he's judging the world, the sun's darkened, the moon gives its light, won't give its light, the stars fall from the sky, heavenly bodies are shaken. At that time, when that destruction is taking place, God will come and pull his people out. Now, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer's coming. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it's right. It's near, right at the door. Now, it's debated whether all the signs we just read about precede the destruction of Jerusalem or the end of the age or both. I say both. It's Some of it obviously is applying to something past the destruction of Jerusalem. And some of it's applying to Jerusalem. You have to read it. Think about it. Know this. The fact that Jesus has not come back in his glory in the clouds to gather up his elect, the fact that that's future is known by the fact that it hasn't happened yet. I know it's not dumb. It hasn't happened yet. So some of this stuff is coming. Some of it has immediate impact, immediate uh, application to those people in the first century, to the disciples. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. Now, if he's talking about that physical generation, then he's talking about the destruction of of Jerusalem and the temple. But if the word for generation, and I haven't investigated this yet, I'd be interested to get somebody's input on this, If he's speaking of this generation as the collective people from this point forward, from the ushering in of the end times, which again is ushered in by the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we're in the end days, you and I. If that's what this generation is referring to, then he's all right, this generation won't pass away until all these things have happened. I tend to think that this word, this generation, is referring to all people from then till now and perhaps on into the future. Why? Because all these things haven't happened yet. 
Jesus has not come back in the clouds with all his glory. The angels have not collected up the elect from the four corners of the globe. That hasn't happened yet. So I tend to think when he says this, truly I tell you, this generation won't pass away. He's talking about people from that then through now. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Now, this is a very important passage because I've highlighted words because be on guard, be alert, keep watch, keep watch, watch. This is incredibly important. Jesus wants us to know and to be aware. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the son. Jesus didn't even know. But only the father, be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house, puts the servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you don't know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening, midnight, or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, don't let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. These these are Jesus' last words to his disciples in a, in a teaching environment. And he's telling them, look, be aware. And it, those words come down through the centuries to us. Be alert. Be on guard. Just because he hasn't come back yet doesn't mean he's not coming back. Just because uh, 2,000 years have gone by and Jesus hasn't returned in the clouds doesn't mean he's not coming to in the clouds. He's just not here yet, and we to be on watch. We are to be on watch. Now, what does it mean to be on watch? It means to be alert, be aware, know all you can, learn and observe your environment. Uh, God has given us words to read in His Bible, and He's given us our five senses to watch what's going on around us. He's given us a brain, a mind to think, to analyze, to to uh, work out these things. Be on guard. Be alert. Be on watch. Watch. Now, regardless of what you think about all the stuff in this chapter, that does not negate his command to be on guard. We are called to think on these things, to ponder these things. And probably you and I may come to different conclusions. That's fine. I don't mind coming to a different conclusion. I don't mind people who come to different conclusions to me. We need to be on watch. We need to be on guard. We need to be alert. Now, why do we need to be alert? Is it because we might miss miss it when he comes back? I don't think it's going to be. I I don't think we're going to be able to miss when he comes back. What are we we to be on guard for? We are to be on guard and alert because the enemy of our souls is at war with us. And when you're at war, you keep a watch. You fight your battle with wisdom and courage. Be on guard. Be alert. Keep watch. Watch for his return, but also watch what's going on around you. Be aware. Don't be stupid. Don't be unalert. Unalert? Did I just make up a word? I might have just made up a word. Does that make sense? There's some cool stuff in here. I could go on and on and on, but time runs out. This is an important chapter in Mark. I think possibly the most important chapter because Jesus lays out our future. Be alert. This is Paige. Here's my coffee. Folks, I'm out of here. Have a great day. Bye-bye. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Neither should my thoughts be your thoughts. You need to think for yourself.